Warning, an unavoidable part of capturing footage for the original House of the Dead is that a large amount of white flashes happen. Those with sensitivities towards bright flashes or strobing, please be advised and watch at your own caution. Eagle-eared viewers of the channel might have picked up that I'm a fan of House of the Dead. Specifically, when I need to do the haha -ha, funny man YouTube sound effects shit, I layer three House of the Dead 2 sound effects over each other, like so. So when it was announced that House of the Dead 1 was getting a remake, a large blue-skinned looking ass dot was put on my radar. Now, two things about House of the Dead 1 being remade as a concept. One, it is on some level important to see this game remade because the original source code to it has been lost. The game we know isn't coming back, so unless you have a cabinet somewhere nearby that thankfully has both working and well-calibrated guns, the only other option is emulation. There are ports for the Saturn and PC, but uh... Two, I am not particularly a fan of remakes. I have a hard time not being pessimistic towards the works of studios past being given to new groups and then having them shoulder the responsibility of either following the vision of an earlier set of creators or adapting that work in a new image. This isn't to say that I'm like 100% dead set no ma'am against remakes, like Resident Evil 1 remake is one of the most amazing games ever, but more that I think the process opens itself up to many more pitfalls and that I personally prefer the original work being ported forward with as little changes as possible. Obviously, that is not the case available here, but I need my thoughts on this subject heard because, well, it's not like you didn't read the title to the video. So, before we set up court for the All-Star Weekend Slam Dunk competition, we should at least go over the original game as much as possible. For historical sake, for comparative sake, and for the game's sake, because it fucking rules. When I was in grade school, probably seven or eight years old, I remember having some sort of book where I was supposed to draw the answers to questions it presented. When the book asked me what I was scared of, I distinctly remember trying to draw this guy. I had seen the then new House of the Dead 1 cabinet at a couple bar and grill restaurants my family went to. Remember, this is the 90s and arcade cabinets were just like a lot more places. And being, no joke, fucking terrified by this game. I had nightmares about the blue skinned zombies, and why wouldn't I? Look at this attract mode! It is to this day the best representation of common nightmares. Creatures chasing you while you cannot move fast enough to escape. Everyone's had one of those nightmares. It paints a scene not only of terror, but of eventual demise. You see that some of these people do not survive this encounter. It's bleak, horrific, and rightfully scared the pants off of not even 10 years old young Jay. For years, I would make a real mental effort not to even look at the cabinet if I saw one in the wild because that's how badly I feared its contents. The House of the Dead 1 sits at a pretty influential point in the light gun genre. Arcade games featuring a physical gun are one of the earliest permutations of video games out there, and so, as a genre, it has a long line of worthwhile history to it. The 90s saw a rise in possible technology. 1992 gave us Lethal Enforcers, the first light gun game to feature digitized video. 1994 brought in Virtual Cop, the first fully 3D polygon light gun game, which had Sega revolutionizing the industry. And then in 1995, a then financially struggling Atari Games made bankroll by releasing the incredibly successful Area 51, a light gun game that blended both the digitized and the 3D rendered looks and showed the financial viability of the genre at that time. So, in relation to history before it, House of the Dead 1's not particularly groundbreaking? Like, as much as it gets credited as a big step in horror, particularly in advancing zombies into the mainstream, it wasn't really even the first of that style. 
previous to it, you had Beast Busters, you had Crypt Killer, you had Corpse Killer, you had Zombie Raid. It's not like these concepts weren't explored until now. So, what is it about House of the Dead 1 that makes it so special? Maybe House of the Dead 1 wasn't the first 3D light gun game. It wasn't the first horror light gun game. Shit, it wasn't even the first light gun game to have blue skinned zombie looking ass creatures. But that's all to its benefit because House of the Dead 1 is one of the best light gun games of that era. It was able to pull from Sega AM2's experience on Virtual Cop and build on top of the concepts that that game introduced to do it all better than anything else that was on the market at that time. A more advanced version of limb damage from Virtual Cop shows up as you can now blow off individual digits of zombies. Instead of just the ability to select stages out of order, you now have cool branching pathways that give meaningfully different ways to traverse through the level. It was also just fucking better than anything else out there. What game looked like this? What game sounded like this? House of the Dead 1 wasn't the first, but it was definitely the goddamn best. Special attention needs to be paid to how the game handled its combat and camera work, because this is probably the most trailblazing aspect House of the Dead brought. Because the zombies are predominantly attacking you with melee, you have to switch up the manner in which the game operates. Previous light gun enemies often had guns of their own, creating a shootout-styled encounter. Uh -huh. Virtua Cop had a threat timer that showed when the enemy would shoot. Time Crisis 1 introduced a cover system to incorporate a back-and-forth flow between you and your opponents. And games like Area 51, you, uh, just got shot, I don't know, sucks to suck, don't get hit. There were wrinkles to the shootout style of gameplay, but typically, the only time you would see a melee attack was when someone popped up in front of you as a quick reflex test. Thinking about how to approach gunplay when the targets are not shooting back, but instead trying to approach, changes how you interact with the game. The difficulty now lies in how to obfuscate the targets while they become threats to the player. Animal creatures move in ways that are hard to pin down. Zombies can rush you in groups, forcing you to decide which one is the highest threat. You are, let's just call it what it is in this context, jump scared a lot more often and forced to react quickly. And one of the best ways this plays out that I don't think I've ever seen commented on is that the role of innocent targets change. Previously you would have innocents show up on occasion who test your reactions because you don't want to shoot them, but then they just pop back down and continue hiding. In House of the Dead 1, the innocents are an active part of the encounters. You have to not only not shoot them, but you have to stop the zombies from killing them as well. This is one of the first things the game teaches you. This dude gets got as soon as you start the game, and you can't stop it. So when the next encounter shows two scientists getting chased, you have the opportunity to intervene and save them. This is a large part of how encounters work, because it's not often just saving an innocent, but the encounter will be planned in such a way where it's difficult to do so without accidentally shooting them as well. All of this plays into how the camera takes this game from good to fucking great. Previous light gun games still felt tied to more of the carnival shooting gallery DNA. Static shots, lots of moving via tracking shots, not much was available in terms of creative camera usage. Once we got to 3D you would see more movement between locations, but it was still based in that stationary stop and pop shooting style. The kind where you focus on one vista too long and wonder how approximately 17 humans fit behind these barrels. In House of the Dead, you are constantly moving, every encounter being a small battle between you and a handful of smartly placed zombies. It makes the space feel real, and in doing so, makes the space feel fucking terrifying. Let's look at the first encounter of Chapter 2. You deal with the zombie in front of you, turn right to deal with another one approaching, then turn twice as far left to find one is really up on your shit. The way this is paced implies that you were being flanked by two zombies at the same time, but you could only focus on them individually. But just because you can't see this dude running up on you, doesn't mean he's not there. This makes what you don't see scary, because there could be, at any moment, a zombie coming up on your blind side, and the camera might not show you this until it's almost too late. Another example of this, and probably the best encounter in the game, is the twisting staircase. You run up each ramp, stare directly at the wall, pause, and then snap turn to the next ramp. This is obviously setting up a jump scare with a zombie being there on one of these turns, which ends up coming true. But it's all the camera work that sets this up to be so effective. But once you get to the top, you encounter these two axe zombies, but the camera angle blocks your ability to see what's over here. So just because you have dealt with these two fuckers, 
doesn't mean that you are safe because there could be more zombies when you finish ascending. The last part, and my favorite aspect, is that once you are on the top and exiting the area, you see that there are still zombies nearby over here, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa what are we doing? There's still dudes over here, excuse me, are we taking care of this or not? This rules because for me, I am now scared that there's a possibility that they could run up behind me as I try to get out of the zone and into the next one. The camera work, the pacing, the feeling of real space, and the encounter design make this game fucking top notch. And you can tell how good it is because after House of the Dead 1, you got a noticeable amount of light gun games with heavy influence. Beastbusters came back with The Second Encounter, a game that significantly ramped up the zombies and gore, but still plays like a pre-House of the Dead affair. At least I assume it does! Who the fuck's seen a Hyper Neo Geo 64 in the wild?! Then there was Evil Knight, an important game in my eyes because it's such a low-rent House of the Dead knockoff that it makes you appreciate how good House of the Dead is. It's a mostly fine enough game, but all the interiors look so bland and samey, and it works as a foil to showcase how beautiful the design work in House of the Dead is. I did play this game back in the day, because you will never be able to forget that they gave a zombie a fucking weed whacker as a weapon. There was also Carnival, which... I don't know, I kind of like this game. Like, it's bad, but it's given it its all. It's leaning super hard to the mid to late 90s edgy ultra-violence and throwing out Dutch angles like it's buy one, get two free. The encounters and bosses and honestly most things are not great, but it went all out in trying to make a game in a post House of the Dead world and it's got this uncanny jankness that makes it more effective than I think it was expecting. So, if anything, we can see that cashing in on House of the Dead 1's popularity was easier said than done. <coughs> the game is a certified banger, and I have so much more to talk about, but we can save that for later. With a healthy understanding of what makes House of the Dead so great, let's look at what Megapixel accomplished in remaking it. NOTHING! NEXT CHAPTER! Nah, I'm just fucking with you. There is actually one small creative change that I think mega rules and is purely additive to the game. After the first encounter, the dying scientist will hand you the picture of the staff, and at the end of every chapter, any scientists you let die are scribbled out. This is an upgrade from the original game where the photograph never changed, and it was kinda just implied that you picked it up off his body. Also, the voice acting is surprisingly one of the most one-to-one -one things in the remake, right down to how inconsistent Rogan sounds at certain points of the game. Sophie? Sophie! That voice. Sophie. Are you okay? Sophie! It's a dead end. We won't let you have it your way, Kurian. I'll get you, Kurian. Sophie? <laughs> Sophie! Help! That voice! Sophie! Are you okay? Sophie! We won't let you have it your way, Kyrian. It's too late! This must be the security card. I'll get you, Kyrian! As far as the main game goes, I, uh, don't really have a lot of nice things to say. But one thing I was hoping for when this remake was announced was some sort of a remix mode where tried and true encounters of the original game get swapped out to make a new experience. We didn't get that, but we got something close. Horde mode. In Horde mode, many of the basic encounters are now lousy with zombies. Like fucking packed to the gills with these dudes. I will be honest and say that I don't really care for this. I think flooding the screen with zombies exacerbates many of the problems this game has and is indicative of the House of the Dead 4 and Scarlet Dawn mentality that I'm not a fan of. But regardless, I am happy to see its inclusion because something different like this was what the remake was needing. And I can't be too down on it because I did experience a small handful of completely original encounters. So while minor, it did the job I was looking for. Now tackling horde mode with just your pistol is a nearly impossible feat. Instead, what you should be doing is trying to unlock the new armory. Another cool addition in Remake is that if you successfully pull off a run where no scientists die in front of you, Rogan busts open the armory, and you can now find a secret weapon in each chapter. This additional firepower makes Horde Mode much more manageable and feels like the intended experience. Once again, I'm glad this is in the game, 
but it's not for me. This is definitely some Scarlet Dawn's DNA being backported into the first game, and I do not care for that style of gameplay. In an interview with Wiki of the Dead, project director Artur Grzegolskin and co-producer Benjamin Alsum confirm as much, mentioning that Scarlet Dawn was an inspiration on Remake, and that Sega kind of told them it should be? I'm kind of weirded out by this because I feel like, and maybe I'm the idiot at play here, the main goal should be creating a faithful remake of House of the Dead 1, and uh, I'm putting on my tinfoil cap on this one. I kind of feel like the Scarlet Dawn DNA in Remake is cause for so many problems that the game has. That's just me theorizing, by the way, but when it comes to stuff like how damage works now, that's how I'm seeing it. <sighs> We're gonna cover the bad stuff in the next chapter, so we'll be there a while. What wicked song have I been saving for a rainy day? <clears throat> this one will be perfect. <clears throat> the zombies do not always die when you blow their heads clean off. How is it possible to miss one of the most critical aspects of the game, almost any shooter ever, and the cultural depiction of zombies in the decade since? I'm sorry, I had to get that off my chest before we got going. <laughs> Dr. Kyrian's mansion is host to numerous bloodthirsty abominations, but none of them are more dangerous than the fucking camera in this game. So if you didn't catch the verbal filleting I gave the original cameras earlier, it's a very critical part of how good the experience is. Not only in how it plays, but how in shaping your view of the game's world and how you fit into it. Remake fucks up the camera as early as, and I cannot stress this enough, the very first encounter in the game. So in the original, the way the camera tracks action is that it will gently move itself to either help frame the zombies in a way that communicates where your priorities should be, or sometimes it purposefully blocks the scene in a way that obfuscates a threat to add tension to the encounter. This relationship between the camera and the enemies on screen is a natural one. The movements are smooth enough that you do not need to recalibrate your bearings, and in cases where a more drastic shift in perspective happens, the threats either give you enough time to gather yourself, or sometimes patiently de-aggro until it is their turn to attack proper. In the remake, this relationship is not there at all. I cannot tell if this is the fault of the camera being more jerky than Herb Dean trying to decide in real time if he should call for the finish in the main event, or the enemy encounters not being in lockstep with the camera movements. But regardless of who is at fault, the camera work does unignorable damage to the game. To make sure I'm not an idiot, I saw that there was some sort of aim assist setting in the options menu, and I did have that turned off, so this is not some additional layer of mechanical fussing. This is the way the game plays naturally. A massive example of this camera fuckery in play would be the left elevator path in Chapter 3. Once you get down the elevator, there is a descending lift that slowly reveals a scientist in trouble, and then, due to the perspective, reveals the zombie who is about to attack her. This encounter is perfectly paced in showing the information in a good order, and the camera stays on the action in a way that allows both the scientist and the zombie to be grounded in the scene. In the remake, this encounter is totally fucked! Because as the lift descends, the camera snaps back and forth between the scientist and the zombie at a pace that isn't communicated, and thus you are constantly recalibrating yourself trying to shoot the threat and not accidentally blow a hole in the scientist. However, this isn't a hardwired camera direction it seems, as during another run, the camera gets hung up on focusing too high and I actually lose sight of the scientist altogether. I assume what's going on is some sort of coding for a dynamic camera focus, but it's not working so hot, my dude. So going back to the very first, and I'm going to drill this home until I'm blue in the face, the fucking first seconds of the entire goddamn game. You can see in the original how the zombie is slightly left of center and the camera gently pushes the scene in a way where he's naturally centered. In the remake, the zombie is once again left of center but the camera fucking snaps the shot to center him, which throws off the player's aim because that motherfucker ain't where he just was a second ago. 
Even small encounters like the Bed of Worms are wildly more awkward now because instead of having a static shot that easily fits all four threats on the screen, the remake's encounter has the camera move back and forth, making the tracking of these small targets so much harder for no good reason. Compounding this is that after you end an encounter, the camera dips down and follows the body of the last zombie killed, as if Rogan is appreciating his fucking work or something. A seemingly minor, but actually major change the remake did was give the zombies ragdoll when they die. Not only that, but when they ragdoll, the camera stays on them and you get a little bit of extra time to shoot them if that's your jam. Compared to the original's pre-canned death animation, this, uh, this really sucks. For starters, it adds additional camera movements on top of every encounter as instead of constantly having a clear view of your forward momentum, you sit there and big game Hunter Rogan debates on if he's going to put this capsized torso above his fireplace. This doesn't necessarily affect the gameplay, but it does make trying to hit items in the downtime between encounters harder as the camera is not on its usual track and is instead focusing on a pile of rotten beef at Rogan's feet. What this does affect is it absolutely kills the pacing as additional pause is given after encounters regardless of if it's warranted. The camera is just all over the place in this game. The remake doesn't understand how to properly use it so a lot of things that were not issues in the original suddenly become fucking issues. In the original, you see the scientist backing away from a threat and you catch a glimpse of a zombie before the pillar blocks it. The camera gets into position and you see the threat emerge from behind the pillar, giving you the line of sight to deal with them and save her. In the remake, this encounter is already too far along, so the first zombie is already way up in her shit and you need to try and lead the shot because the camera is still moving into a stable position. As you can see here, I fucking overshoot my target and instead pump an innocent full of lead. In my favorite encounter I mentioned previously, the camera doesn't live up to its potential. Instead of that pause for anticipation and then snap turn increasing the tension that something might be down that next hall, it rather lackadaisically turns and just murders any of the suspense the hallway is supposed to have. Oh god, and when the camera decides to stop ripping cases of bottom shelf gas station energy drinks and just be stationary, it still can't get it right. The Chariot boss battle is just a static shot on Chariot as he moves towards you, completely butchering the intimidation of this hulking creature that crashed in and fucking walloped Sophie. In the original, the closer Chariot gets to you, the more the camera shrinks downward. He becomes a taller and more imposing force with every step he takes towards Rogan, and it sells the monster as this powerful behemoth that you are backed into a wall against and cowering from, instead of in the remake where Rogan's just fucking eye level with the dude and standing his ground like his feet are locked in place. Speaking of bosses, let's move on to how Hanged Man and Magician are worse fights now. Chariot has this incredibly obvious seeping wound and reeling back animation when you hit him, but Hanged Man and Magician require multiple hits to knock them out of their attacks. The original handles this by making them flash white when you hit them properly and delivering this loud, snappy sound effect. Both visually and orally, you know when you have landed a clean shot on these dudes. So obviously, the remake does not have this. giving you fucking no feedback on if you are damaging the bosses. This rings true for Hermit as well, but that boss fight blows, and I'm sure a toddler with two eye patches and a poorly calibrated light gun can kill that boss without taking damage. Also, as an aside, the Magician boss battle is much worse now. He moves so slow and so rarely goes into his rapid movement melee attack that he becomes about as easy as the Hermit. But it gets so, so much worse when it comes to the rank and file enemies. This will be discussed in more detail in the next section, but the visual choices made in the remake make the game so much harder to parse what is going on. The most fucky gameplay thing they changed is the constant in damage. Not only do successful decapitations not always guarantee a kill, something I am still in disbelief is real, but the amount of damage and energy takes to kill them can vary. All these small critters are supposed to be one shot, one kill, but sometimes, they too can survive with their entire face blown off, making encounters harder for no reason because instead of feeling secure in yourself that even the smallest of threats can be dispatched in a logical sense, you have to be prepared to fucking double tap a goddamn worm. 
On the flip side, all the, as I affectionately call them, fucked up little guy enemies sometimes melt with just a bullet or two. This is a problem, as the whole point of this genre of enemy is that they commonly attack in pairs and are invincible after taking a bullet. Making the player keep track of two fast, elusive, and often projectile throwing targets at once because you can't just burst them down. This whole style of encounter is just missing from Remake now because in most cases, you can just make Swiss cheese out of them the same way you do for any other damn zombie. Lastly, we have to talk about the performance issues. I'm playing on PC and it's rough. I thought at first the hitching and lagging was caused by trying to record while playing, but after doing a couple runs without recording, that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to happen the most when turning into a new encounter, as if the game is struggling to load what is next on screen. It's also just really choppy and ungraceful moving in a lot of areas, and sometimes in cutscenes I get audio desync as well as most of them looking so weird, like it's done out of engine. It's not horrible, but it's definitely not great, especially when trying to play horde mode. Before we end this section, let me just outgas some aimless bitching for a moment, please. What the fuck are these loading tips? If you can't dodge, <clears throat> of course you can't dodge. It's not a fucking function in this game. Pro tip, to defeat the cyber demon, shoot at it until it dies. What in the god damn. Hey, why the fuck does this zombie get to be the specialist boy that ever lived? There's this really funny decision to make the dude in front of the door have this long get up animation where you can empty charitably a full clip into him before his animation ends and the game says he can take damage now, thank you for waiting. They fucked up one of the best encounters in the game! I already mentioned the first encounter of Chapter 2 and how it illustrates the world beyond what you can see, but in the remake, they don't send both zombies at the same time. They start running when you turn to them. What a fucking bummer. A very funny but very stupid side effect of the ragdoll deaths happened to me when I killed one of the Moody's and he ragdolled against the door and looked like he was still standing up, so I couldn't tell if he was dead or not. The ragdolls are so goddamn stupid. It's imperative to communicate to the player visually that they did their job correctly so cornball shit like this doesn't happen. There are roughly 25 lines of dialogue in the whole game. I don't expect much, but I do expect someone to notice a typo before the fucking final boss. I know Megapixel is a Polish company, so I can't confirm their English proficiencies, but the gallery mode reveals some serious machine-translated entries. Type 0, codenamed Magician, is Greatest Curian's masterpiece, created to rule human. Apparently his tack is most beautiful. It is powerful creature even though it is still under development. I guess it's possible that Megapixel was given these entries in Japanese, and they machine translated them over without a second look, but there are numerous examples of stilted English that could have easily been cleaned up. Reload fatigue is a real thing in this game. Every time you empty your clip, you get a reload prompt. Not every time you fire with an empty clip, but after firing the last bullet in your chamber, you will get a verbal reload prompt. This is egregiously annoying to deal with. From what I've seen reported, my issues are not PC exclusive. Multi Brawler reports that version 1.02 on PS4 still has random damage, headless zombies, no changes to boss fights, no updates to spelling and grammar mistakes, and one of the fucking craziest bugs I've ever heard of. Apparently, the PS4 version doesn't give bonus health for saving scientists and hasn't been fixed as of this version, which is Fucking insane. filled to the goddamn nines with more bullshit than an entire season of hoarders. There are numerous problems with taking a game as clean and trimmed to the fat as House of the Dead 1 and modernizing it visually. There's just so much stuff everywhere now. Obviously, the first place this causes friction is trying to figure out what is shootable and what is not. 
In the original, it was very obvious what you could interact with. Boxes and barrels stood out prominently in the landscape, and buttons or doors were visually important enough to call out to the player as items of importance. But you would also get small rooms like the kitchen where you could shoot up a couple of the pots and pans for fun. It wasn't all just prizes to hunt for. This dovetails into one of the coolest tricks the game plays on you. In Chapter 2, you enter these residence rooms, and the camera holds on a bookcase a little longer than normal. If you fire on the bookcase, you will find a scientist who is hiding behind it. Emboldened by your discovery, when you enter the next room, you'll see another bookcase, fire on it, and find a charging zombie, because fuck you, the game has tricks up its sleeve. Cute interactions like this give the game so much life, and now in Remake, you are up to your armpits in cluttery bullshit, not all of which is shootable, and most of which does not matter a goddamn all. But it's not just the environments. Gameplay is now impacted by two new things, massively enlarged squibs and score point pop-ups. When you plug a motherfucker in this game, they bleed like a stuck pig, and when you plug a motherfucker who's close to you, you better hope that Rogan has windshield wipers over his eyeballs because it takes up so much space in your vision. This wouldn't be as big of a problem if you could, oh I don't know, trust the amount of bullets you put into something leaves it for dead, but because it fucking doesn't, you can have close encounters where blood is spraying all up everywhere, blowing a head off the zombie, and still take damage because this game's damage system operates on moon logic. Take this sequence where the weird radioactive spider crabs are falling on me, I obviously hit one and get a huge blood splatter that my monkey brain deciphers as feedback that I hit my target. But I still take damage! I've run this footage back a bunch of times, and I still can't tell what I took damage from. The second weird clutter addition is the score point pop-up. To be upfront, I have never cared about score in the House of the Dead. I'm more of a shoot for 1cc kind of guy, but I know some people do. I am simply not qualified to talk about the differences in scoring structure between the original and the remake. However, score point pop-ups happen when you successfully shoot an enemy in this game, kinda. So just because you shoot something doesn't mean you are inherently getting points for it, and just because you are getting points for it doesn't mean you have done enough damage. Let's see this in action. In classic scoring, you get 120 for a headshot and 85 for a kill, so you can get golden point totals for a headshot, but that doesn't mean you've killed them. Here I got a headshot and I get a golden point total which my monkey brain, now working overtime, reads as successfully killing the enemy with a headshot. But that's not the case, as I need to shoot them again for the now standard point total to kill them. The visual language of feedback is so muddied that you would want to use point pop-ups as confirmation of hits or kills, but the system doesn't really work like that. Thankfully, you can change this from the default to make it minimized in a way that doesn't harm on-screen action or remove it altogether, and I highly recommend you do so. Also, as a quick mention, if you are playing on modern scoring, the clutter makes more sense as according to the Wiki of the Dead's breakdown on the scoring system, you get a small point bonus for shooting background clutter. Another thing that doesn't help is the addition of lighting. The original game, through technical limitations of its time, did not have dynamic lighting effects on the landscape. Everything is flatly colored, and that rules because items of interest, read as zombies, are allowed to pop out in the scene. In Remake, there are now lighting sources goddamn everywhere, and the zombies are painted by their color, or lack thereof, when in range of them. Let's look at the scientist's rave room in Chapter 3. In the original, it is practically iridescent with the amount of colors on the walls, but no matter what you are looking at, the cool blue of the zombies stick out, letting you immediately identify who your threats are and what type of threats they are. In the remake, the scientists have dialed back on the amount of ecstasy they are on and instead bathe the room in red lighting. Now the scientist, the Gilmore, uh, and the other two fuckers all look similar because they are bathed in the same color. But what's worse than being in the light is being outside of the light. Fucking heaven help you trying to identify a zombie that is in the shadows. You get a burst of light from your gun, but more is needed when it comes to seeing a group of zombies enter the screen and parsing out who is what target. This was originally never a problem. When you first enter the laboratory in Chapter 3, you can easily see the two Harris behind the window because of their bright colors, and one of them is winding up their attack. In the remake, it is much harder to see them, they no longer pop out, there is distracting lighting chopped up by a fan, and for some reason, the other Harris is the one that attacks first now. And now, let us take all of these complaints and showcase them in what I offer to you as the worst encounter in the game. 
In the Chapter 3 sewers, you turn to see this scientist run up on by two Ebbeton. At least, what I thought was two Ebbeton. I cannot make out what the first dude is because they are both completely in shadows, but in review it looks like someone else. I blast the dude in the foreground, but his ragdoll body falls on the Ebbeton in the back, and possibly protects Ebbeton from a bullet or two. I unload what I think to be four shots into the Ebbeton, and am confident he isn't going to survive because Ebbetons are the weakest zombies in the game, but due to a combination of his homeboy's ragdoll body shield and this being God's chosen warrior, the Ebbeton does not die. The scientist is whacked, and the Ebbeton, now emboldened by the divine might of Christ our Savior, survives what could be upwards of seven or more bullets, including a gold score pop-up which is a headshot that didn't kill, and then finally, a score pop-up for a body shot that puts this holy warrior in the dirt. Almost everything wrong with the game can be summed up in this encounter. The lighting obscuring visual confirmation, the wildly erratic damage values, the non-communitive score pop-ups, the visual clutter, the ragdoll physics, all of it makes the game so much worse to play than the original where this encounter is something so solid you can set your watch to it. You know how bad it gotta be for the 1996 facial models to look better than the 2022 facial models? Wicked. I just saved the world's ugliest wax statue. We are kind of getting into more subjective territory here, but the zombies... Okay, okay, let me correct myself. The creatures. In canon, these are not reanimated corpses. They are creatures born from Dr. Kyrian's lab. I always kind of like this wrinkle because it explains a little bit why you would have 50 of the same dude in the mansion. They are assembly line productions, so it makes sense that there would be multiple of the same creature. Anyways, still totally gonna call them zombies, and the zombies in Remake look like garbage. Their Gatorade Frost Icy Charge skin has been dulled to the point where it's more of a gunmetal gray tone instead. And the previously fleshy creatures like Harris or Gilmore have had their muscles turned into a muted green. As somewhat mentioned when talking about lighting, these vibrant colors were a helpful tool in immediately figuring out who the threats on screen are and the strong hues of their bodies act as canvases so you can clearly see the damage you are doing reflected on them. Yeah, it's that type of review. It's almost as if they have too much damage on them now, but nothing actually sticks out. As much as Rogan and G are the protagonists, the zombies have always been the stars of the show, and the varied cast of different zombie permutations are so strongly designed that they have become the capital C characters instead of just bullet fodder. And speaking of... God damn, Kagio, my child, what have they done to you? Kaguyo is one of the most iconic zombies in the franchise, and here he is looking his worst. His trademark ratty hair has been lessened to be barely visible, his exposed teeth don't pop in the design, and they gave his lone eye a pupil. He looks like he should be chasing Ash alongside the other skeleton deadites in Army of Darkness. We've had multiple games of stellar Kaguyo designs, but Remake finally broke the streak and delivered this goofball Halloween prop given life. And I think that's the best way to describe Remake. Goofy. House of the Dead as a whole has always had a campy side to it, but Remake feels like it's focusing on that aspect above all else. The original game was filled with terror. Chariot fucking belting Sophie into the wall, Hanged Man dropping scientists to their death. The zombies move with both a speed and a still coldness befitting of unthinking, unflinching, unstoppable objects. Growing up, I would have nightmares because of the space of Kirin's mansion is so well realized that I wondered if any scientists truly lived. I may have saved them from their current threat, but how much farther could they go before meeting their demise to another zombie? Like, just compare the Simon who yeets this scientist off a bridge in the beginning. To me, one of them is scary, and one of them is goofy. <laughs> oh, here we go. The music nerd's gonna get on his soapbox. Okay, so we are going to camp out for a long time on music because it is big important to cover how fucking buck nasty the House of the Dead 1 soundtrack is. In the past couple years, I've started thinking about the context of music and how it relates to its effectiveness. For example, when 2010's era Brostep was the biggest wave of electronic music around, I never could get into it. 
I eventually came to terms with the idea that I was listening to it in the wrong context. Brostep's formula is so reliant on massive drops that the intended listening for most effectiveness would be at a live event where you can feel that bass ripple through your stomach. Me listening to it at home robs it of that context and thusly robs it of its effectiveness. Many other styles of electronic music can operate like this. There's genres that do not grab me during at-home listening or listening in the car that can just tell are much more suited for, say, being mixed up at a club. I bring this up because I believe House of the Dead 1's soundtrack is a masterclass in understanding the context of where you are going to hear it. I am first going to clear the air. My projections on House of the Dead 1's soundtrack are just that. This is my interpretation of Tetsuya Kawauchi's work and is not backed up by interviews or other confirmatory sources. With that said, the soundtrack feels designed to understand that the context it is going to be heard in is a loud and crowded arcade. This OST somehow pulls off the impossible by invoking a sound palette indicative of horror pastiche while also being bombastic and energetic enough to make itself heard in a room of other games and never at the cost of the game's tone. Let's look at what I would consider the four big songs of the game. Tragedy, Revenge, Truth, and The Magician's Theme. The standard boss theme is fine, but it's understandably a shorter tune. Same with Chapter 4's House of the Dead, because that chapter is less full stage and more of a formality before The Magician. And the Attract Mode song is a phenomenal piece for setting the stage, but it is primarily that. Stage dressing to get you to understand that this is a true horror experience you are in for. Anyways... Tragedy kicks off with raucous guitars and nearly siren-esque synth notes, establishing a tone both high in intensity and high in alarm. We are also introduced to the House of the Dead refrain. This sequence is an auditory signature of the game and comes back in different forms, even after House of the Dead 1. This song sets the stage for the game beautifully and introduces us to its electronic elements as we get moments of creepy synth work like in the bridge. It, alongside the constant siren of alternating synth notes, invokes a feeling of alarm or panic as you discover just what sort of unholy abominations freely roam Kyrian's mansion. Revenge is where the party starts. A hypnotic, synthesized bass line guides a chugging organ melody through an intense sprint. This is high-paced energy befitting of the House of the Dead's cold tone and snappy pace of play. But then the bridge hits and we get these awesome synth pads. <laughs> This incredibly contemporary break in the action feels like it's screaming to be sampled and thrown over an amen break. So that's exactly what I did. You also get another well-placed horror pastiche as the organ melody acts as an auditory signifier as like a phantom of the opera feeling, perfectly keeping the tone despite the sometimes noodling notes and electronic dance backing. And then, the star of the soundtrack, Truth. Rogue 
Logan and G throwing it back on the dance floor as they return of the Living Dead 5 rave to the grave. This is the highlight of House of the Dead's sound profile. Hard rave synths with a cold mechanical techno beat backing it up. But at no point does it lose its horror pastiche. You get the pitch bent lead synth melody that imitates uh, Sorry. Man, that just like keeps happening. It's like I should edit that out or something. You get the pitch bent lead synth melody that imitates the spooky ghost sounds you would hear from porch decorations on Halloween night running around the subdivision. All of this makes for a sound that perfectly signifies House of the Dead 1's style. High intensity action while still offering creepy, spooky horror vibes and doing it loud enough to make a statement in a busy arcade. And then the finishing blow of the game, the theme of Magician. triumphant climax to score an amazing boss battle. There is this tension and conflict to the melody that strikes the perfect chord for battling Kyrian's masterpiece. Not only that, but the House of the Dead refrain comes back with a slightly changed variation to bookend the game. So yeah, the soundtrack fucking slams. It puts in so much work taking the game above and beyond with its multifaceted sound design that somehow is able to serve multiple masters both in the game and in the context of how it would be experienced. A sound that blends the tension and drama of the operatic with the unflinching mechanical steel of a Detroit techno show. So how does the remake handle the soundtrack? It doesn't. The remake doesn't have the original soundtrack. It's not fucking there. In the aforementioned interview with Wiki of the Dead, co-producer Benjamin Asu states, It would be more reliable to do the new OST, as adding the original music forced us to go through the complicated licensing progress. And I just... Oh man, I don't know, dog. So elsewhere in the interview, it stated that while Sega is helping Megapixel and Forever Entertainment, Sega AM1, the original developers of the game, are not. I do not work in the industry at all, but I would have to assume that having Sega helping in some capacity would elevate the licensing progress for something in one of Sega's games. Once again, I could be way off, but hiring someone to create a similar but legally distinct soundtrack seems like a huge undertaking as well, so this decision, especially given the idea that this is supposed to be a remake of the original game, is one of the most mind-boggling parts of this release. Especially since the phrasing in the interview makes it sound like they were not forced to make this choice, but that somehow this was the path of least resistance. I would be more accommodating if there was a legal issue that meant they 100% couldn't get the licensing, but the way the question is answered makes it sound more like they could have secured the licensing, but opted not to. Tetsuya Kawauchi's wall-to-wall -wall banger soundtrack is not in this game at all, and in its stead is a dollar store knockoff version that aims to replicate the original work sans copyright issues. And it's... it's alright. Its greatest crime is being in proximity to House of the Dead and House of the Dead's original soundtrack. New tragedy tries. It really does. And I think it offers the best moment in the whole remake OST by keeping the House of the Dead refrain and putting a monstrous cymbal crash on the quarter notes that drives home the intensity of the melody. But it 
also showcases the biggest sin of this new soundtrack, and that it invokes an entirely new tone with its sound palette that is at odds with the tone the original soundtrack brought. Just listen to these super squelchy notes in the main melody. Whereas the original knew how to blend in its horror elements in a way that never came off as campy or cheesy, the remake often falls squarely into cornball monster mash tones. And this is not related just to tragedy, Revenge also has the same problem. This, alongside the more guitar, acoustic drum, and brass presentation of the music, lends itself to an entirely different vibe. It's no longer an intensely cold industrial rave at an old gothic cathedral. It is a campy 80s monster movie all too familiar with the cultural imaginary of what zombies and classic horror invoke. And then, it just gets uncanny. Forgive me for anyone watching who's not a fan of OSW Review because I'm about to steal a joke, but Jimmy Hart, you've done it again! Many songs, specifically Revenge and Truth, have the same melodies but with the serial numbers filed off. I get that the assignment was probably to create something as close to the original without tripping copyright infractions, but it's just weird sounding. It is maybe the breaking point for me when it comes to this game being a ship of Theseus thought experiment. Post-production Jay here. I thought I'd put this in the script initially, but I guess I didn't. Uh, I've been kind of dogging the soundtrack pretty badly, but I should probably put over the new version of House of the Dead. Uh, <laughs> because the original song has almost nothing to it, they just use the introductory notes of it, and then they created an entirely new song that goes on for like six minutes and is a pounding, weird frog rock thing that has absolutely nothing to do with the game, is tonally completely weird and not connected to House of the Dead, but fucking rules. It's just so weird. It's almost too long. You can basically complete the level before it even finishes, but holy crap, they like... Just decided to have a bunch of fun with it, so I'm gonna play a little bit of that as well. House of the Dead Remake wears the wireframe of the original game, but with so many parts replaced, I do not know if I can truly refer to it as such. Replacing the music, altering the way it looks, having different damage calculations, new gameplay rules that were not in the original. Could you even consider this House of the Dead one anymore? The goal was to bring this release to the modern audience, but instead of introducing today's market to the classic via the original release, it instead offers to show you its favorite band's music by taking you to see a local cover band sloppily perform their hits. That may sound overly harsh, and it kinda is, but let me ask you one question. If you had only played the remake, would you understand the greatness of the magician boss fight? Because no matter how similar they appear to be, one is a high watermark for the genre, and one is a flat interpretation of it. If the goal was to present House of the Dead 1 to a new audience, then it failed in presenting it properly, and even worse, when it comes to remakes like this, the new audience may never know the game is being misrepresented at all. Da 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 da
As much as I poo-poo the remake, I need to impress that I think this idea was doomed from the start. Digging up someone else's work and trying to put the pieces together as some Frankenstein's monster isn't exactly preserving the original. Even though I stated up front that it's somewhat important to see a remake of this game due to the lost source code, it is on an undeniable level flawed because it's not the original work, and it can never be. So what's the solution? Well, no gaming company wants to acknowledge it because it's not profitable, but emulating the original game works wonders. You can get a Sega Model 2 emulator, slam the House of the Dead 1 ROM in there, and boom, you're playing the original. Like, actually the original, with all possible arcade dip switches available for stuff like difficulty and blood color. And that kind of leaves me with a strange perspective on who this game is really for. If you've never played House of the Dead 1 and you pick up Remake, well, I don't say this to sound like some try-hard video game defending butt picker, but kind of still haven't played House of the Dead 1. It feels like this would be a better game for people who have already played House of the Dead 1 and want to see a slightly new spin on it. Maybe that's true. I know at least one fan of the original that still likes Remake, so forgive me for being a critical butthole about it, but one way or another, it's not for me, and I feel like my reasons for disliking it are pretty valid. I don't really do reviews like this often, but I feel like I should end this by saying, you know, uh, don't bother with this. Go out and find the tools necessary to emulate the original and have a grand old time with it. And when you're done, make sure to play House of the Dead 2 because oh fuck, we might have to do this whole rigmarole all over again. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. Intel has told us there are at least seven. Okay, I already see one. Give them. Okay. They're the same picture. <laughs>